Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I will, um, you know, it's, 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 we're getting to the end of the day, so I'll try to be uh, as uh, energetic as I can. Uh, still, uh, I just think of the great lunch that we had. Uh, and the way you know, you'll see the way I've kind of set it up or, or organized structure, my speech is in kind of three big you know, division portions. First thing I'll talk about uh, Bombardier. You obviously uh, some uh, some uh, some information about Bombardier with China. Uh, then uh, I want to talk about use some examples of success in China. Uh, some 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 of the key themes, issues uh, that you encounter, that we encounter, that I have observed in China. And, and then I want to talk about uh, bringing it to a more personal level. Uh, I think I think where you guys come from, a lot of you seems to be uh, either students, recent graduates, or professionals. Uh, I'd like to talk about you know, how you can be successful in China. Or I think today is the, uh, it's a bit more popular to say with China. Uh, so uh, first time I'm going to ask to do a speak here. Uh, they told me uh, you got a great need for you in success in China. And it reminded me of one of my first uh, assignments at Bombardier uh, when I joined Bombardier in 2006. I was at the end office, which is my first assignment was to write a speech for the Uncle Mundo Chairman. Uh, he was going to Shanghai. He's a, a member of the uh, International Business Leader Advisory Council. These are the groups created by uh, most of the non mayors. So that was for the uh, mayor of Shanghai. And the theme was something like uh, the peaceful rise of China and will to the innovation. And I got you know, that theme from, from our, our office in Beijing. So if you just start thinking about it, we'll get it for more information in the next few months. Like, okay, you know, that's uh, kind of a broad theme. And uh, I got, you know, a few months later, I got more information. And the more information was basically a paragraph on, you know, peaceful rise, innovation. You know, I, I was not better off with the paragraph. So uh, I ended up writing these speeches every year uh, for till uh, 2010. We talked about innovation. Uh, we talked about how, um, I remember 2009 or 2010, how government officials were assessed and how this assessment system was driving uh, the, the China growth in this specific way. Uh, we worked on the uh, environment, and most of the things were related to the five year plan. Right? So it was a great experience. Thanks for the very broad uh, theme. Brings uh, very good memories. Uh, if I talk about a bit uh, about Bombardier, um, for you know, sometimes I assume that everybody else about Bombardier, but I'll just give you a very brief uh, overview. Uh, Bombardier today is two business units. We build trains and we build uh, airplanes. The train business is uh, it's pretty much half and half in terms of we look at employees and. 77,000 employees in the world. Uh, they build uh, high speed trains, metros, subway systems, uh, trams. Uh, the, the, big, you know, the big portfolio, we're number one in the world. And uh, we're doing very well in China too. Uh, here on the space, what we do is business jets. For anybody interested, you can come and see me afterwards. Uh, uh, business jets and commercial aircraft. And um, we do some of the interviews as well, you know, like the, the five flying planes, the cool the yellow planes that we do. So that's basically the business that we're doing. If you look at us in China, we are, I would say, the most successful uh, foreign train manufacturer in China. We have three or four joint ventures and a few uh, wholly owned from enterprises. And uh, I think that if we think about the success of our transportation in China, that's something that you know we can apply to any industries. The Chinese have their objectives, their development interests, and what we did in transportation was to come in and align our business with those interests. So we helped basically China build its real uh, infrastructure, the real uh, transportation industry, and we benefited from it. And the Chinese uh, also did. Uh, they learned a lot. They, uh, you know, they built a lot of uh, trains themselves, and now they, you know, they have a very competitive uh, position in the world now. Uh, in aerospace, I should say that 
Uh, in aerospace, it's a bit different. In China, you probably have, a, don't quote me on this, a few hundred airports. Uh, in the US, there's probably like a thousand, fifteen, fifteen hundred airports in the US. So even though the potential is there, the, the infrastructure is not there yet. But the good news is that China is building something like four new airports every day and for every year.
that is going to stay at the Four Seasons in the Shangri La, or you know, another very sensible hotel. If instead of sending an expat, you hire a Chinese uh, uh, person, uh, that person will probably choose a different hotel, a much cheaper hotel, right? Because she's seeing the bill in yuan, as opposed to possibly you know, like, oh, it's a thousand yuan. So basically, we're saying that you, know, you have to think about that. And that's why uh, you will never be, somebody like said, you'll never be the Chinese price. You know, that's why you know, a, a foreigner will you know, have very different uh, points of reference. So these are, these are some of the things that you have to think about. You, know, you may be good in the US, but maybe the Chinese is a different, different story. And that, you know, that $100 example brings us to uh, uh, what I call the you know, key drive. In the West, in business, we value growth, we value profitability, productivity. These are, you know, when you make a decision, business decision based on, based on these drivers or indicators. If you go to China, uh, you, a lot of people are making a mistake. They expect the Chinese to make a decision based on the same drivers. And I think William or, or some, somebody in the, the, the panel Stability is the most important, I, I, I would say, TPI in China, right? I don't know, we have a delegation of Chinese uh, uh, people uh, a while ago. We're talking about Chinese inflation. I think the inflation in China is bad. You know, it's, it's, it's not bad, but, you know, it's growing. And the guy said, well, you know, inflation is not that important. Unemployment rate is important, right? Because unemployment rate is, is, is directly linked to social stability. So when you do business in China, uh, you have to think about these things. You cannot come in and say, you know, I'm offering the best product at the best price and believe that it's going to work. Uh, and uh, when you work in uh, highly strategic industries, uh, we are talking about you know, the key strategies, the key industries, uh, like uh, high-tech manufacturing. Uh, these, these are very important industries for the Chinese, which means that you'll have a lot of government, uh, not intervention, but your involvement. And uh, you have to think about this. You, you, you cannot come with your product and believe that you will be able to buy it uh, based on your competitiveness. A lot of Chinese companies are buying their way in the industries. Right? It doesn't matter if you lose money in the next 10 years. What they want is the knowledge. Uh, they want the capabilities. So, like Henry mentioned that earlier today, you know, they're not building an economy, they're building a country. And that means that they're taking other aspects in their, you know, when they make decisions that are pretty much different from here. And this is the issue that you're going to have with your, your bosses. When they go to China, they say, well, you know, I'm investing a few millions, expecting to make money two years, you know, in two, the next two years. Yeah, I feel like you may have it, but I think you should try to be a bit more realistic, depending on where you are as well, like in terms of the knowledge that you have, in terms of the industry that you're in as well. So, drivers, key drivers, and, and what is valuable in China is not necessarily the same thing. Um, I had a discussion with a colleague uh, a while ago, and uh, he was saying, well, you know, this is my business, I have different business lines, this is where we're making money. Um, we're producing in China, we would like to sell in China now, uh, but it doesn't work because we, like, uh, the competition in China is, is just too low. So what works, you, you just have to take the same recipe. Sometimes you have to adjust your, your business model a bit like versus going. Uh, uh, sometimes you, your product is not going to make it in China. It, it's just impossible because of price or for any other reasons. It's not going to work. So what you can do is you can take your core skills, right, and build in that product. Because sometimes your core skills can be, you know, move to something else. Uh, and I think I think companies don't do that enough in China, which explains a bit why some of them are, are failing. So there's the vending thing, and then there's the where you fit in the big picture. Try to sell uh, environmental, environmental friendly technologies to a Chinese uh, government official uh, and 
five years from now, that was not necessarily the best, the best setup. Right? It was not necessarily part of uh, your objectives. You know, they needed growth, they needed GDP, they needed GDP growth. So real estate was a big thing, uh, manufacturing. You, you have to figure out, you know, and I think uh, Sarah could do a question that I want to look at the five year plan. Look at these things. And if you don't fit, find a way to fit in these objectives. Because these objectives are drafted at the highest level, and then they go down. Everybody is aligned to this. And I think they're very good at strategy. And you know, and, and setting targets. Um, they're, you know, they're good and bad things about this, but they, they, they're very good at, at you know, cascading down the objectives. So you have to fit in there. Otherwise, you're, you know, you guys have a lot of energy trying to sell something that you don't want. You know your objectives, you know where you fit. Now you have to figure out uh, who to talk to. Right? And there's a lot of people stuff. I think uh, everybody has great connections in China. You know, you're going to meet anybody in China. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm connected to you right at the top. And, uh, and it's fine, you know, it's, it's a fair thing. But uh, I think one of the uh, mistakes that we make is sometimes is that we say, oh, China. You know, uh, China is like this, or, or the Chinese. And uh, you know, sometimes you have to overgeneralize. So the, the trap here is that. You start thinking that China or Chinese governments all think the same, all have the same objectives, all agree. And when you want to negotiate with Chinese, with the Chinese, you have to pull on all the, the strings and push on all the projects at the bottom at the same time. So you may be, for instance, you, you're dealing with a partner, negotiating, uh, everything's going fine, you're drafting the rest of these, your big boss is, is flying in. And then after lunch, they come back and they, they tell you, you show a resolution. There's, there's, a, there's a detail that's not working. Right? That's a pretty important detail. Right? That's your most important task. And, uh, and then you stop. If, if you, you're on a time sensitive uh, schedule, uh, you're in trouble. Right? If you just bought like, a one way ticket, you got time. Then you, you, you have to figure out who could help you. You can go to the, uh, the province, the CC government, uh, a competitor. You could put pressure. You know, if you come back and it's like the example, you know, I've got a contract with this company, you want to work now. You have to pull up all the strings. And I think, uh, I think, it, it, you know, I'm from, I'm from Quebec, I come from a small town in uh, northeastern Quebec, and I was not uh, trained to negotiate. You know, you go to the big bar, you buy something, <laughs> there's a price tag, there's no need to negotiate. Uh, you can negotiate your car, you know, your house, but in general, I mean, there's a price tag. And uh, I remember when I went to China, I was studying in Nigeria University. I was so scared. I would go buy apples. And they were telling me, I don't know, it's a uh, two year. You crazy? And then you 
say, uh, you spend a week in China, you come back and you're ready and you want to write a book about China. Uh, then you spend a year in China and you're like, hey, perhaps I'll write an article. Yeah? Perhaps. If you spend a bit more time, you think, I don't want to get into this. It's far too complicated. So I think it's a bit like the you know, the more you know about China, the more you realize you have no clue what's happening. Right? <laughs> but what I realized when I was negotiating in China is that even if you know that you don't know, that's your that's your advantage. Right? That's you know much more if you know this this part of China, uh, that's this part of much and the rest of the people in the organization. And you don't necessarily have to be a China expert to, to bring value to your organization. So go to China, uh, try to learn as much internship traveling, learn the language. And uh, we were talking a bit earlier, people were asking you know, what kind of opportunities I can have. I, I would say that a few years ago, uh, if you were a, a white Lao Wai, you could easily go to China with a degree in back in the days and get a job like this. It's not the case anymore. Because Chinese students are coming here, they go to Harvard, they go all over the school, they speak Chinese, they understand the culture. So uh, if, if you don't have that, you have to position yourself differently. Right? So you have to think about, a bit like a business, you have to think about what are the key drivers, what do they need? And I think for some people who were born here in Canada, one of the values that you can bring to the, uh, the Chinese investment here is, is your knowledge and culture here. Because you have the companies, uh, Chinese companies coming here, they don't necessarily have the PR skills, uh, or the government relations skills, or the corporate social responsibility knowledge that a company has to have when they operate in Canada or the US or the West in general. But you can have that. Uh, well, you can have that, that understanding. So this is, you know, it's, it's not just about you know, selling in China. Uh, the, the growth of China is, is benefiting us in, in a different way now. Because they're 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 uh, they're lagging. So I think I think one of the kind of the key role that you can play whether you're a lawyer or accountant or, or entrepreneur is the, the I call it the cultural translator. Because uh, China is a different plan for us, but the West is a different plan to the Chinese too, right? Uh, I think it's changing because you know Chinese are traveling a bit more recently abroad. And there's a lot more contacts with, uh, with, uh, with the outside world. Uh, but still, there's a knowledge, there's a way you manage your boss in Montreal, not the same way you manage your boss in, in China, right? And you, if you take part time jobs, try to, you know, try to gain real world experience that you can be able to, uh, to, to market out to uh, the employer here or in China. Um, uh, the other thing is, uh, I did a training at uh, UBC a few uh, years ago, and we spent, uh, I think, a week in Vancouver, a week in Shanghai. We, we did a very interesting exercise. Uh, we, it was a mix of uh, you know, foreigners and, and Chinese uh, business people, and they gave 
plus the border of our south dancing. In conclusion, I think, you know, uh, there's uh, some people are optimistic or, or pessimistic about uh, the growth of China. I think the growth of China is 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 a great thing. And stability, I'm starting to embrace stability as well. Um, you know, you want uh, a lot of people are saying that some people would like China to uh, have issues with their financial systems, I think. No way we win, and the way we've kind of served the, the crisis uh, shows how China can be important for, for the global economy. So, yeah. <laughs> Students tend to go to Europe 
Western educated Chinese uh, students because they want to gain that management uh, skills that they don't necessarily have or don't have the same, the same level. So I think, I think it's going to become more. I think the Chinese companies, even if you don't, you have to take it out of China of the Chinese. Uh, I think it will become more and more global. Yes. Yeah, I guess that's 
your value proposition. So your value proposition in China can be the same here. What's the value by Chinese consumers? Not necessarily the same thing here. So the business model can work. Uh, uh, I don't want to put a guarantee on this, but I think you know. 